Hello, my name is David Keeter, and I'm from the uh, University of California Irvine Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for putting together this course. And uh, today you'll be learning a, a little bit about um, semantic markup of um, data set, of neuroimaging data sets, um, and the tools and techniques that have been developed under the Reprenum effort and um, other efforts uh, supporting the neuroimaging data model or an IDM. So we'll begin um, this uh, lecture with uh, about a little bit of background about linked data and uh, the semantic web, what it is um, and how we're using it for neuroimaging. Brief introduction about the neuroimaging data model, uh, linked data format and what it is. Um, this is likely to build off of your previous um, lectures on semantic markup. Then we'll talk about uh, some of the tools we have and techniques for um, turning your uh, bids data sets into what we call uh, semantic bids or repro bids data sets um, that contain uh, the proper annotations for enabling query across bids data sets. And then we'll look how to, uh, and this is facilitated with the IDM uh, metadata files. And then we'll look, about, uh, look at some of the tools we have available for querying these IDM documents and other things you can do with them. So essentially, uh, as you all know, um, the World Wide Web um, traditionally has been uh, built by um, linking documents, one document to another, using um, uniform resource identifiers, URIs, or uniform resource uh, locators, URLs. Um, and this ends up uh, creating a, a web of linked documents um, but a lot of these documents um, contain data or other resources um, and they're discussed via text which is human readable but uh, not really uh, good for uh, machine readability. Um, so what uh, we'd like to do is turn uh, and move away from a web, web of linked documents to a web of really linked data linking the data together, the resources together, uh, providing context um, and semantics to the information that you're finding uh, on websites uh, uh, and linking a lot more of the information together to create sort of a, a web of, uh, of linked data. Um, if one were to uh, look at the four design principles of linked data, um, put forward by Tim uh, Berners-Lee. Uh, essentially, um, linked data is a set of design principles for sharing uh, machine-readable uh, data. Um, it consists of uniform resource identifiers as uh, the names of things. Um, we use the HTTP protocol to uh, be able to dereference these um, URIs. Uh, so that people can uh, look up and find out more information about the data, the resources, um, metadata, virtually anything. When someone uh, looks up the URI, it must provide useful information and it includes links to other information such that we create a graph or a, a web of, of linked information. And so uh, one of the syntaxes for um, representing these data and resources on the web is called the Resource Description Framework, or RDF. Um, we'll use that a lot in the um, upcoming slides um, in our Python-based libraries. But essentially, RDF, uh, you, you're essentially making statements about data and about resources. These statements are formed as triples where there's a subject, a predicate, and an object. And the subject is a resource, um, which is identified with the URI. A predicate is like a verb, um, which specifies a relationship between the subject and the object. And the object is uh, a resource or a literal um, to which the subject is related. So say I wanted to um, tell you that the Brussels is the capital of Belgium. You can see below here in this red box, that um, first there's the subject, this is Brussels, 
Brussels is a URI here, uh, a web address that one could go and dereference and get information about Brussels. The middle part in blue is the capital of, that's the predicate. Um, one would typically have a URI there to uh, the definition of capital. What does capital mean? And the last uh, part of the triple, the object, can be a literal like Belgium, but that's not nearly as useful as having another web address or URI that says, here's what Belgium is, um, and points out to another location on the web where you can find additional information. But for what we, we're going to see today, no matter um, what triple or statement about neuroimaging data we're just talking about, you will, they will all have a subject, they will all have a predicate, and they will all have an object. So what do we do um, with uh, linked data uh, in, the, in the field of uh, neuroimaging? So um, many years ago, as uh, work supported by the INCF uh, Neuroimaging and Data Sharing Task Force initially, and uh, supported by grants to a uh, grant to um, Tom Nichols and Camille Mamet, um, and uh, a more recent grant to uh, myself from NIMH um, and others to work on the neuroimaging data model. Um, it was also has been supported for many years now by the ReprintM effort. The neuroimaging data model is essentially just a set of specifications for using provenance to link um, neuroimaging data throughout the data life cycle. Um, the idea is that we, um, we want to track the life cycle of our neuroimaging data from the design of the experiment. That's an IDM experiment model, uh, what data is collected, um, you know, descriptions of that data being collected could be descriptions of protocols, the whole project, so forth. Link that data with the workflows used um, to perform a computation on those data and the results that are generated from those computations. Um, these uh, series of specifications are built upon a solid foundation from the linked data communities, the semantic web um, technologies. And um, we build upon that using the PROV model, which is a provenance vocabulary uh, for uh, linked data. And the idea is that you can use these basic building blocks to describe provenance. Uh, you can use those same building blocks to describe uh, both the experimental metadata, the workflows, and the results using and looking at it as if um, you're uh, tracking the provenance of this information. So there are three really components to NIDM, the NIDM experiment, NIDM workflows, and NIDM results. We'll see uh, today, we'll be looking at uh, NIDM experiment um, and how, how we use that within the neuroimaging community. We'll, we'll touch on a little bit on um, some um, results uh, sets, but uh, predominantly this will be about NIDM experiment. So again, like I said here, this depicts the different um, uh, stages in uh, uh, data flowing through um, from our experimental data collection to the analysis and workflows to the derived data and ultimately to the publication and distribution of both the code and the data on the World Wide Web. We'd like to link all these steps together using a structured machine readable um, syntax, which uh, we have chosen uh, to be the linked data. Um, the NIDM experiment model has a very simple uh, hierarchy um, of objects that, when uh, put together, can create very complex graphs. These objects are based on the PROV model vocabulary. So we have these blue boxes here and yellow boxes and white boxes. The blue boxes are activities. They are uh, events that have a start and end time. Um, they generate these uh, yellow boxes, these entities, which would contain um, you know, uh, the actual data. And they're linked together with uh, edge relationships to create a graph, that, uh, an annotated graph that um, is a pretty simple hierarchy that we all, uh, I think, fundamentally kind of understand in neuroimaging. We have a project, the highest level, uh, everything's rooted in a project basically in one of these NIDM graphs, NIDM experiment graphs. The sessions are part of projects, 
Uh, acquisition activity, acquisition entity pair are part of a session. These are data that's collected, could be neuroimaging data, could be assessment data, could be genetics data, it doesn't matter. There's some kind of acquisition that generated some kind of data. And so this acti acquisition activity and acquisition entity uh, pair um, are connected with a was generated by relationship. And then in these white boxes, you see a list of um, statements essentially uh, here, where each of these uh, each of these other boxes, the blue ones or the yellow ones, can have um, any number of statements you like. You can continue to make statements about the data or about the activity, um, as long as you follow the uh, uh, RDF uh, syntax rules, which is subject, predicate, object, URIs, literals, that sort of thing. So here um, in the top left box by the project um, activity, we have just some simple um, predicates listed there uh, where it says DCT colon title. That's actually a URI uh, in these data files you'll see later. You can dereference that and that's basically saying the DC terms terminology um, title term is defined at this URI. And so what we're saying here is the project, that would be the subject. DCT title would be the predicate. We're telling you about the title. And then a literal after that, which would be sort of the title of your project. And so from uh, using these rules, you can make uh, just uh, pretty much any statement that you want to make about your data or metadata. And so using these basic building blocks here, we've also introduced these um, orange trapezoid-like uh, geometric objects, uh, that's the agents. Those are um, uh, things that um, take responsibility for performing one of the uh, activities or are associated with one of the activities. Uh, here, you can use agents as MRI scanners or as you know people, um, and the people can have different roles um, with this had role relationship. But you can see, basically, we have the same hierarchy. We have a project. Uh, the sessions are part of the project. We have these acquisitions. We have here depicted one assessment acquisition where there was some assessment data like age, uh, handedness, and so forth, a demographic survey of some kind. And then we have an image acquisition activity uh, that was performed on a scanner with a certain manufacturer and so forth. Um, and uh, so these graphs can get pretty complicated. If we were to then take these graphs um, on the left here in the red box is an example of an IDM experiment graph similar to what you just saw, um, except for it's been reorganized slightly. Um, but basically we have a project, we have sessions, we have a bunch of assessment acquisitions, we have a bunch of imaging acquisitions. We've now uh, then used a tool like FreeSurfer, um, which you'll see uh, later on. Um, we have uh, created a, a little, uh, wrapper around FreeSurfer to uh, format the output according to um, the RDF syntax. But essentially in the blue box here, you have the results of performing a FreeSurfer computation on uh, some of the image data and storing the brain volume, surface area, that, the statistics that you get out of FreeSurfer about the brain. The nice part about this system is we have links now from the volume computation directly to the imaging data that was used to compute those volumes all in a linked data graph and um, accessible using the same core set of tools, queryable using um, linked data uh, query tools and, and uh, able to be validated using linked data validation tools. So if you were to take this graph and you were to serialize it or write this graph out to a file on disk, it would be an ASCII file. And the um, semantic web or linked data um, community has authored many different um, text formats for linked data. And um, we prefer to, in an IDM, group to use the turtle syntax because we think it's most human readable, but really uh, you can use any of these um, syntaxes. So what you'll notice here, uh, we'll uh, look at the middle uh, panel with um, some of the uh, RDF statements. So um, the first statement says that there's this NIDM colon unique ID thing 
that's the subject. The subject here is something. We don't know what it is, so let's continue to read the statements. It says the NIDM UUID, and then it has an A. A is short for RDF type. RDF type, again, is a URI, and if you went to the RDF terminology, you would look up type, and you would see it's the type of, of this thing. And so we read this, this uh, NIDM UUID is of type, NIDM acquisition object. Okay, and if we think about the um, pictures we just saw, that's a blue acquisition um, activity, or uh, sorry, this is a yellow uh, acquisition entity. So uh, you can read this statement, this NIDM thing is a NIDM acquisition object. It's also a prov entity that uh, bring, uh, links us back to the prov terminology that this is an entity. Uh, this thing has NIDM acquisition modality, NIDM uh, magnetic resonance imaging. All, anytime you see the, um, this you know, short phrase and then a colon and then another string, um, that's a URI. So one could turn that into a URI and go and find out from the NIDM terminology what an acquisition modality is and find out from the NIDM terminology what magnetic resonance imaging is, but we can make some assumptions here and say that's just a regular MRI that we would all, uh, that we all love. Uh, this thing also has an image usage type of NIDM anatomical, so whomever uh, collected this data thought that this particular magnetic resonance imaging sequence should be used as an anatomical scan. It then has a file name. And then you'll see the was generated by relationship. That's the named edge that we saw between the entity and activity in the previous graphs. So one could read down through this in a similar sort of way and see that there's a functional scan, um, a couple of them. Um, and there's an assessment instrument at the bottom with some data. Um, so we have built a, um, a Python-based API uh, for working with these NIDM documents. It contains the class hierarchies, um, just as you saw in the previous slides. There's a class for the project class, there's a class for sessions, there's a class for acquisitions. Um, there are um, functions for querying, reading and writing and visualizing these documents. Um, along with some um, along with some documentation, although um, that still needs a, a little bit of work, but there is there is documentation. Um, and then uh, we haven't worked too much on the schemas for validating each of these objects just yet, but the Blueberry project in Canada has been using NIDM um, documents to import neuroimaging data into their linked data database, and they have written some shackle schema. So we are sort of working with them on um, using some of the schema that they've already written to validate some of these documents. So let's, let's think about, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar at this point with the brain imaging data structure or BIDS. If you're not, uh, very quickly, um, BIDS will, uh, uh, is a specification for how to organize your uh, neuroimaging data, although there's extensions now for um, MEG data, EEG data, PET data, um, and many others uh, in development. But essentially, it's a specification for how you name folders, how you name files, and uh, essentially the organization of things, what kind of file types you have in the directory structure for what kinds of things. Um, this is compared to and um, historically where we get, you know, DICOM images, or we still do, I guess, DICOM images straight from the scanner platform. They are kind of um, uninterpretable um, in their organization and numbering system. And using some ReproNim tools like Hudiconf and ReproIn, one can directly from their scanner convert to this bids hierarchy. Um, making the um, data set much more manageable for a, a human. So, but one of the problems um, <clears throat> with the BIDS data set is that um, inside these uh, participants.tsv files, which might contain any number of columns with variables that were collected during the course of the study, um, without any definitions uh, or a data dictionary essentially for those variables, it's um, very difficult to first interpret um, what those variables mean and, um, and how they were coded, um, but also uh, very difficult to query across 
um, data sets. So for example, even something simple like age, in one data set it might be called age, in another data set it might be age at MP rage scan, in another data set it may be age at last um, psychotic event. And if you just were interested in a data set or data sets uh, that contain a variable measure of age, you would have um, trouble doing that query because the variables are named something different. And without uh, what they call a JSON sidecar file, which is this participants.json thing, um, which is meant to store the data dictionary for your participants.tsv file, it's very, very difficult to then even make sense out of what's there um, in those TSV files. So we're um, calling our augmented version of bids um, semantic bids or repro bids. And essentially what that means is a, a well annotated bids data set. So one with a JSON sidecar file, which we'll show you how to create. And from that, we can create a linked data uh, metadata record, um, this 90M turtle file um, that lives at the root level and is part of your bids ignore file so it doesn't uh, break the bid standard, it still validates, but yet you have this RDF style metadata file at the top level, and we'll see uh, in subsequent slides what you can do with that, um, which is pretty, it's, it's pretty interesting, and it helps us query across data sets, and you'll see that as we move forward. So what does the JSON file look like, this sidecar file? So for, for bids and the bid specification, it's a simple JSON structure. It has keys, basically a dictionary um, of dictionaries. Uh, and so the key is the variable name and then there's these properties like description or URL where you can find more information about that particular uh, variable uh, levels if it's a categorical variable which gives you a mapping from you know a numerical scale to some kind of string. Um, you know, often in databases they'll store you know uh, ones and twos and those mean yeses and nos for this particular variable so this is kind of the that, that level of information. Um, so that's the basic participants.json file. We're going to augment that with uh, more properties um, and we're going to do that using the annotation workflow depicted here in this slide. Um, so this workflow applies equally to with, uh, whether you have a bids data set of images and assessment data or just a bids data set of images and separately you might have some CSV comma separated value files that contain your assessment data. They can be together, they can be separate. We have different tools for each of these. But essentially what both tools do is they will load, uh, so for in the bids case, they'll load each TSV file in the bids data set. So participants.tsv, any phenotype TSV files that are in the phenotypes directory if you've added um, phenotypes to your bids data set. These are things like additional assessments and so forth. The participants.tsv is like sort of a summary level information um, and you could include entire assessments in the phenotypes directory. But, for, but basically it traverses the bids directory space. It gathers information from the organization of um, the images and some of the semantics that are embedded in the organizational structure of bids. And then it opens up each TSV file, picks out the variables from the header row, and searches for those variables with you interactively, and we'll see that in, in our tool. Um, searches the Interlex information resource, which is down at um, UCSD. Um, and Interlex has imported many terminologies that are available in ontologies and incorporated them into the Interlex. It has a nice REST API. It's easy to use, so we've been working with that group. Um, it also contains some of the NIDM terms terminology, which is an R01 funded by NIMH uh, recently to, to help uh, you know, provide the tools and techniques for querying across data sets, uh, publicly available data sets. Um, and so you do this interactive search of the interlex. Uh, first of all, what you do is you define a, uh, your data dictionary for your variable that um, done separately from the interlex and then you can uh, decide uh, to associate higher level concepts with your variables so in the higher level concept idea is well let's go back to the age example if one study collected age postnatally and uh, at the time of uh, study enrollment and another uh, study collected age at the time of scan and another study 
collected age at the time of last uh, psychotic event. Uh, for your particular data analysis project, you may only care about initially, let's see what the subject counts are for data sets that have a measure of age. We, at this level, do not care what exactly they were measuring with age. All we care about is that they have this broad concept of age. And so uh, what we ask people to do when they're doing their annotations is decide, you know, think about the community, think about what people are going to want to search for at a high level across data sets. And uh, if you think that your variable uh, is useful for a, a cross data set query, then you would associate this high level concept, a high level concept with your variable. And that's where this um, interlax uh, term search comes in, where you're searching the interlax for concepts. We also search, um, you know, cognitive atlas has been um, imported in interlax, um, a lot of uh, other mental health uh, database uh, terminologies have been imported in there. And so we do this search for a concept, you associate a concept with your variables if you think it's appropriate for cross data set query. And what comes out of this is a JSON sidecar file that's been augmented with our additional properties. And we'll see that and uh, coming up. And because now you've associated a complete data dictionary with your data elements and you have some links out to um, concepts, we can use all that information to create a linked data file at the root level of the bids hierarchy. So we're gonna go through a little sort of practical exercise here in the next couple of slides that show you how uh, this is done. Um, this will create a searchable NIDM metadata file in your bids directory and help you annotate this bids directory. So to install our Python-based tools, PyNIDM tools, uh, pip install PyNIDM, um, Datalad we're using here, it's not required, but it has some nice properties when using Datalad. The PyNIDM tools are aware of some of the uh, Git logs inside of a Datalad dataset. And so it can um, get information like if your images are accessible via URL from Amazon Web Services, it can pull those URLs out from the Git logs and from the data lab data set metadata and put those into your IDM file, which makes it really nice if you have a workflow that wants to go out and get images, do some computation even on the cloud, you know, um, and uh, put a result back into the NIDM data set without you know, ever having the images locally. So you can do a pip install data lab to get data lab. And if you wanna work on the exact data set this, you know, depicted here in this um, slide presentation, you can do a data lab install. We're gonna work on the ADHD 200 Brown site um, bids data set. And so you can do this data lab install to get the Brown site, then you can, and all this does is install the structure. It doesn't actually copy any images down. So you can use a data lag get recursive dash r and you uh, will get the images for the brown site of the ADHD 200 study. Note some of these data sets that are publicly available in bids don't have some of the bids require files. <laughs> uh, so that's another, uh, that's a problem that is not, uh, is beyond the scope of this presentation, let's say, but you may have to create a data set JSON file a data set description JSON file in this brown data set if you don't get one when you download it via data lad. Um, and our tools will tell you this is not a valid bids data set because they use pi bids to, to load, in, load it in. Um, sorry. Uh, and the next thing you need to do in order to be able to query the interlax is get yourself a free API key. You go to sitecrunch.org, you create yourself a free account, you go to my account, API keys, you generate an API key, and then you set an environment variable in your bash shell, interlex API key with underscores, and our tools will recognize that and be able to log into the interlex to query for things and add things and so forth. Okay, so here on the left, this is what the bids data set looks like for the Brown site from the ADHD 200 study. You see a bunch of subject directories as you might uh, recognize from bids data sets. You see a participants.tsv file. You do not see a participant.json file, so that means there's no sidecar file here, so there's no annotations of the variables found in the participants.tsv file. Let's take a look at the participants.tsv file. So you notice in this file, we have um, about nine variables here um, on the first row, um, participant ID, gender, age, so forth, handedness. We can look down through the rows and see that gender looks like it's male and female, age is a floating point number, 
um, and so forth. But you know, presumably you're doing this on your data set, so you know a lot more about these variables than we know right now. But we'll just go through the exercise uh, so that you can see how it's done. Um, and so we have these other things like verbal IQ, performance IQ, and full IQ. Um, so in thinking about this broadly, uh, so we have some IQ measurements here. Those might be useful for people to know that are part of this data set. We have gender, age, and handedness. Those things are, uh, you know, typical query criteria for people looking for data sets. And then we have this QC rest and QC anatomical. This is the QC rating for, um, for these particular participants for this particular scan for the resting state data and the anatomical scans. Uh, this information is probably not information that people would query for across data sets. So we would skip the idea of doing a concept annotation or high level annotation of those variables, but the IQ variables, definitely intelligence quotient would be something that, um, you know, we would tag it with, or if they have more specifically verbal intelligence, we might do that for the verbal IQ and so forth. And handedness, age and gender, we're going to tag those with broader concepts. So what we're going to see here in this little video, I used to do live videos, but now I've changed it to doing these recorded videos, um, especially during Zoom times and COVID times. But essentially, what you're doing here is you're running this command at the top, bids MRI to 90 m giving it a dash D parameter, the path to your bids data set locally, and a dash bids ignore flag to tell it to ignore um, to, to add to the bids ignore uh, file. So what is done here is it's looped through and I'm going to pause it here once we get down to the next section. Sorry. Um, so basically what it's done is it's looped through your um, participants.tsv file. It's grabbed a first variable name, not in any particular order. It was gender. Uh, sometimes people name their variables with short names that don't mean very much. In this case, gender is pretty self-explanatory, but you could type in a longer name uh, if you wanted to, or you could just press return and it would accept gender. You give it a definition, you give it a data type. In this case, it's a categorical variable. We know gender in this data file had males and females, so we'll, we'll go with that. It's categorical. Uh, number of categories for this term are two because we have male and female. Uh, in this case, we don't have in this data file any mapping between like a one is male or a two is female or, a, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, we don't have any uh, numerical values associated with the text-based categories, but we do have two text-based categories. So we type those in male and female. And now what we've done is captured essentially a data dictionary for this variable. So the next step in this process, uh, process is to say to yourself, you know, do I want to associate a concept with this variable? Okay, well, gender is something that we should definitely associate a concept with because no matter how you measure gender, I'm sure that uh, people who are looking for data sets want, want to know if you have a measure of gender. So what it's done now is it's taken that query string gender, which is just your variable name, and queried uh, the interlex, it's queried 90 m terms, um, for uh, possible matches, um, and you'll see COG Atlas terms come up too in a separate category, but for this particular uh, one, there is no COG Atlas um, a term or a concept that uh, matches the, the fuzzy matches the query string gender. So you have the option here of number 14 of changing the query string to so say you couldn't find anything because your variable name is is it some kind of like hash or code for a, a longer variable? But in this case, gender, it comes back. Uh, so 90 m terms definition of gender is, seems like a very broad general definition. So we'll go with that. And we have just associated uh, gender, this term, this concept with that variable. So now we're going to do the same thing for age. We uh, also specified the uh, data type and age was a floating point data type. It has a minimum and maximum and it has a units for years. Again, we go through the concept annotation phase. We know that we want to um, associate a concept with this, this broad concept of age. So we, we do that. And so this, this process uh, will continue until you've gone through all your, um, all your variables. So um, and once you've done that, what you get from this process are two things. You get a uh, bids JSON sidecar file formatted with properties, uh, with keys that are um, part of the bid specification. Also, you get a list of additional properties that we've um, included to augment 
this, uh, these sidecar files with um, things like concepts. So in the case of um, verbal intelligence, uh, we went and did the concept annotation here and we changed the query string from verb IQ, which returned nothing up here, to intelligence, which returns all these possible matches. And we're gonna pick one that's just a broad definition that this is an intelligence measurement. And so we're gonna pick 13, the ability to learn or understand or deal with new and trying situations and so forth. Um, so now that we've done all that, let's take a look at what the JSON sidecar file looks like. It's here in a red box. Um, you can see the different properties. Uh, it has levels just like the categorical uh, variable should for a bids uh, JSON sidecar file. It has our categories that we typed in about male and female. It also has this additional property is about, is about is the link out to other, uh, to concepts, to high level concepts that we'll use um, and show you an example of in subsequent slides about how this is used to query across data sets. But you can see you have a pretty good data, data dictionary here. Uh, the JSON sidecar file has been added to the bids directory. You also have this 90M turtle file, which essentially has this data dictionary information, but it also has metadata about the entire bids directory structure. And so if we were to look into that 90M um, file, you would see uh, the standard hierarchy we've seen before, acquisition objects that are entities. This one is an only assessment instrument. We could dereference that and go find out what that means, but essentially it's an assessment. Um, you have a series of variables here. Um, they've been named by your variable names in, um, in your participant data file, TSV file, but also has this hash on the end and that hash um, is a hash of various properties of these data elements um, that helps us match up data elements later uh, to know whether or not they have the exact same metadata properties, in which case the hash would be the same. And if they don't, then, um, then we can go to the data element properties like our data dictionary embedded in these 90 m files and decide, are they different? How, how different are they and why are they different? Okay, so um, if you continue looking through the 90M file, you can see that each of these variables has this data element entity with a bunch of uh, properties. These are the properties that are in your bid sidecar file. And then uh, even more interesting for me um, I, uh, are essentially these descriptions of the neuroimaging data sets. Uh, if the bids directory has um, JSON files uh, to be as, that are associated with the imaging sequences uh, such that it was converted directly from DICOM. We have a bunch of interesting properties about the images that are collected here in the 90M files. And because we did this uh, via a data lab data set, we also get this prod location URL link, which is a link to the Indie bucket on Amazon Web Services where you can get to the actual scan here. In this case, it's a bold functional flow weighted MRI scan. Uh, and so uh, and then the crypto SHA is the SHA sum of that image file. So you could always uh, check that you are getting the same version of the imaging file that was available when this 90M file was created. And then you have a bunch of agents that have the participant ID and project level information. Okay, so what do we do with this 90M file now that we have it? We have a, a series of query tools that can be used. Uh, Py90M query is the kind of the keyword once you install our tools. We have a REST a style API. We also uh, support Sparkle queries, which is the query language for one of the query languages for RDF documents, kind of like SQL. Um, and then we have some parameter based queries, which we'll see in the next series of slides. We also have some techniques for running Blaze Graph, which is a, a local graph based database. You can run it with Docker the command listed here. You can load your 90M files into it and you can use Sparkle with their little web interface to query the files as well. It's a bit faster for querying lots of files than using Pine-IDM, which is based on RDF lib library. Um, but for most, for, for many small things, um, I, and I don't have a concept of how small small is, but um, maybe a couple hundred subjects or less, um, or say, you know, 10 to 15 IDM files or less, depending on how many total subjects you have, this, this would work uh, reasonably efficiently, but then it uh, efficiency drops off when it gets too big. Uh, and that's because RDF lib blows everything into memory. And um, So Pine IDM query, you do the help, you get a list of parameters, basically the parameters you 
really should focus on are dash NL, which is a list of 90M files. It's a comma separated list of 90M files. So you can search across many 90M files here. You can give it a query file if you're interested in writing Sparkle queries and we'll see some of that. Or you can use any of these CAN parameters here like get participants, instruments, frame volumes. Or you can use a URI, which is the REST-based uh, uh, REST based query string, which we'll see an example of next. So if you were to do a Pinatium query of just the brown site and you were to do a dash P parameter, which is get the participants, it tells you the unique identifier, each of the agents in that 90M file and the ID of the participant associated with it. If you were to do a Pinatium query, give it that 90M file and do a dash DE, that's a data elements query. It'll tell you all the unique data elements that are in this file and what type they are, but they're all data elements, but essentially these can be used later to get details about the data elements. Here we'll do um, use the REST API. And so you give it the 90M file, a dash U and slash projects, which is like sort of the highest level. It gives you the unique ID of all the projects in that list of 90M files. And then you can give it the project ID of one of the projects you're interested in. And it gives you lots of metadata about the subjects IDs that are um, enrolled in the study and you can interrogate each of those subjects separately. You can also um, query for data elements and, and lots of different things. You can see our um, read the docs if you uh, are interested or I'll be available for office hours as well. But here for a particular subject, you can see all the data that we have about them. Um, continuing with the REST API, sorry. Okay, so Sparkle queries. So the next thing you can do with PineIDM query, so we'll look at the command in the red box below just to get a sense of what the command is. It's PineIDM query, it gives it a list of, you give it a list of an IDM file just like before, a dash Q and a text file with the Sparkle query. So this Sparkle query is, is you know, um, it's fairly easy to read, I guess. It's, it's, S, it's like SQL for relational databases. You basically uh, don't even have to do this prefix part, but it makes the syntax easier to read. Essentially, I'm just assigning a pre, pre, prefix that says whenever I say RDF colon, I mean this URL. Whenever I say prop colon, I mean this URL. So now you look through this query and it says select distinct count these things as these things. Okay, <clears throat> anything with a question mark is a, a variable that gets bound during the query. So we don't know what they are yet without reading below. So we see We've got this assessment activity um, that has an association with an agent. Um, this, makes, this, this statement will make sure that uh, each activity and each uh, agent is associated with that activity and that that activity is part of the um, study. And that's the project essentially. Uh, and we've done this thing called property paths. We'll need another um, a lecture on Sparkle queries to actually learn this. But essentially what I've done here with this property pass is traversed two annotated edges, both with the annotation is part of from the activities that are returned by this statement. And then we say the agent, in the agent, what we want is a subject ID. And then we want the entities that were generated by these activities up here that we found that had an image contrast type of 90M weighted and this count part counts how many of those um, were returned. And so you see there's 26 T1 weighted images, sorry, uh, 26 T1 weighted images. The next query, this will give us um, the path and URLs for the T1 weighted images. It's just the same, but now we've added a couple new statements here that we say we want some more metadata from the entities um, that were anatomical scans and you would get uh, the both the local path to where they were on disk when you ran the 90M um, uh, bits MRI to 90M and the URL from data lab to where you could get them from the ND bucket. We can make more complex queries where we start to interrogate whether the gender, um, whether uh, what the genders were of, of the participants. We've done it here with this statement, which is uh, the gender uh, variable is a data element. And we've used this is about property. Is about property is saying, okay, I don't care what the variable name was or how it was coded for gender across whatever 90M files I'm gonna issue the Sparkle query against. All I care is that it's associated with the broad concept, this thing gender. And we saw that in the 
couple previous slides that we associated the gender variable with this broad concept of gender. And so from this, we get a list of all the males. So you can use the similar sorts of tools, uh, CSV to 9EM to do the same sort of annotations of an assessment data via a CSV file. You can add that information to an existing 9EM file. It will do that based on subject IDs. Um, you can also add free surfer based data to 9EM files. Again, it will add those based on subject IDs using this SegStats JSON LD tool. Uh, that tool, you uh, point it to either a segmentation file and give it a subject ID or a URL to where those segmentation files are, or you can point it to an entire free surfer subject directory, in which case it will go in and um, figure out what subject ID it is. It will look for in the existing 9DM file if you're adding to an existing 9DM file for a subject ID that matches, and it will add the brain volume data to it. Um, what comes out is again another uh, IDM turtle file augmented with the brain volume data. These work just like the uh, variables from your participant file. You have a data dictionary for each free surfer data element that tells you what it is. And you can use these data element brain volume parameterized queries to look at all the brain volume measurements uh, or um, labels that are uh, data elements that are in there. You can also get the actual brain volume data for all your participants with the BV parameterized query. So um, we have a repository for ReaperNAM, simple to 9 dm examples, which contains 9 dm files uh, created from the bids data sets plus phenotype data from Abide ADHD 200, about 70 data sets in open neuro and uh, uh, core data sets. Um, and we have some more complex queries there that you can you, know, you can look at. These also have um, free surfer and some FSL brain volume data. For the open neuro data set, the way we did this was basically using the same workflow that I've showed you previously. We've used data lab to pull the bids data sets from open neuro. We've gone through our annotation tools and annotated these uh, data sets to create uh, these sidecar augmented sidecar files. And then we've built a query uh, demo um, using these concept level associations um, uh, for open neuro you'll see uh, here in this slide there's this drop down and you can see lots of uh, concepts that have been, have been associated with variables in open in data sets available on open neuro you can use this to quickly uh, search for um, for across data sets for things uh, so in this case it'll be a data sets that have a measure of anxiety disorder and data sets that have a measure of age. Um, once, you, once you do that, and you can then look across open neuro data sets and see that there's three such data sets that have a measure of anxiety disorder and age and continue. So this kind of query technique will be built, eventually uh, added to um, open neuro and uh, supported by the um, IDM terms um, grant. So uh, ReproNim has built uh, what's called the Repro Lake, which is a graph-based database to house all these metadata files. The idea being this will be a place where you can go to query across openly publicly available data sets. Right now, we've included many of these um, data sets from Abide ADHD 200 core and open neuro. This is still a work in progress, still needs a user interface besides a Sparkle query interface. But right now, um, it has a Sparkle query interface, and so we can do some interesting uh, work looking across data sets. 9DM tools, Pi9DM has many tools um, to convert, to concatenate, to merge 9DM files to visualize them. We're working on the linear regression tool right now, which allows you to pick fields from an IDM file, do simple linear regressions with dependent independent variables, that sort of thing, uh, to get a quick look at your data. Um, and this 9DM to bids tool is very much a work in progress. The idea being that the 9DM data files have a lot of information in them. Bids is a view on, uh, of some of that information. And so the idea here being that you could query the IDM file, you could pick certain data uh, variables, fields, image types, create a uh, temporary bids data set, if you will, to use the bids um, tools to analyze, uh, but still maintain all the rich metadata in the IDM files. Here's a link to a bunch of the things I've talked about today. Uh, and some webinars and different things for you to uh, use these tools. And I'd like to thank everybody. There's probably more people than are, than are on the slide, but thank everybody in the funding agencies for supporting this work.
we're pretty excited about um, our future in being able to find uh, publicly available data and reuse it. And I thank you for listening. <laughs>